much that needs to grow today. Rain, rain, please don't go away. I love H2O. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the Master Rain Gardener Certification class. This is where we will teach you to design your own rain garden. By the end of by the end of the, our five-part series, you'll have a rain garden all planned out for your very own yard. This is Susan Bryan with Washtenaw County Water Resources in Michigan. I'm here with Shannon Gibrandel. Hey, how are you doing, Susan? Hi, Shannon. How are you? Good. Also with us today are Katie Whitecheck and Roger Moon. Katie Whitecheck is our water quality specialist and Roger Moon, master rain gardener. Welcome, everyone. All right, well today is the class that you all have been waiting for where we are really going to get into the nitty-gritty of planning a rain garden. So remember this is part of a five-part series. This is class number two and this is where we're going to talk about where to put a rain garden and how big it should be. Next class we'll talk um, about digging, how to do it without expending more energy than you have to. We'll have the fourth class is all about planting design because there are a lot of plants to choose from. The fifth class will workshop some of your designs, give you some feedback, which you can take inspiration from or not, feel free. All classes will have plants of the day where we give you a few rain garden plants that are surefire plants that will succeed in your rain gardens that you can just have in your back pocket when anyone asks your advice about a rain garden. Also, alumni are going to come back each class and tell the story of how they built their rain garden. So, and also there'll be a joke of the day every week. <laughs> this is today's. I know that's what your father calls it, sweet heart, but a nicer word for it is compost. <laughs> 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 compost will loom large in this class, actually. Yes. It's an important um, garden component for any gardening and especially rain gardening. All right, today the agenda is we'll really get into the nitty gritty. So number one, all the rules about where to put a rain garden. So where to put it, where not to put it, how to do a percolation test so you can kind of get a guide on how, what kind of plants, what kind of hydrology you're gonna end up with, so what kind of plants you should choose. How big should this rain garden be? And then we'll go over all the different parts of a rain garden uh, so that you'll start thinking about how you're going to build this and you need to know what to build. Our alumni guest will be Roger Moon talking, going through construction photos of his rain garden. And then the plants of the week will be all about shade. So if you have a shady situation, this is your class. And then I'll go over, go over the homework, which will bring you one step closer to having your very own rain garden design. Okay, so today we're going to talk about where to put a rain garden, of course, but also where not to put a rain garden. And this is almost more important because we're here to solve problems with rain gardens, not create them. So there are rules to help you do that. These are um, all the elements that you need to have a successful rain garden. You need a water source, so a hard surface that will um, collect the water that will go into your rain garden. Water goes downhill, so the rain garden has to be located downhill of that water source. You need enough space and you need some sunlight. Okay, here is an example of someone who was interested in having a rain garden. Let's go over some of the sources that, uh, of water that are going to go into their rain garden. So your, your options are roof downspouts, and you can see that a roof downspout is flowing towards that grassy area. Um, the gravel driveway and also the walkway that goes um, up to their house also is all tilted conveniently um, till it goes into that grassy space. So that's where they make sense to put a rain garden. And then there it is, all planted and dug, all done. And then on the left, I included a photo of it flowering later that season so you could see how pretty it was. So that's an example of using three water sources. Let's go through e each water source one by one with a little more detail. Okay, so the first is the roof, and the roof is the most common source of water for the of water catchment for a rain garden. It's the easiest. I mean, it's already captured by the gutter and then funneled into a um, downspout, and so you, all you have to do is redirect that downspout, and you can make your water go where you need to go. So this is a uh, garden by Catherine Stafford where all the water from that huge roof, it's a big house, um, goes into that rain garden. The next source is the driveway, and it's a little bit harder to capture because most driveways are tilted so that they um, 
flow right into the street, so it's kind of hard to catch that water in some ways. The water often is dirtier, so you're doing more good by capturing this water, so get inspired by that. Some people also can um, solve a problem that they have at the end of their driveway where water puddles. Sometimes the water, the driveway goes down as a, at a slant and then there's a little dip before hitting the street. And in that puddle spot, you can direct that water off the driveway into a rain, rain garden right next to the driveway and that can solve that problem. Like Anna Cairns here actually built a rain garden like that next to her driveway that solved her puddling problem. And there's her, her garden all grown up and looking gorgeous. Attracting some wildlife as well, I see. <laughs> it's kind of like wildlife. <laughs> um, that's a beautiful flamingo sculpture, though, actually. And um, oh, another way to capture the driveway is to put in a trench drain. And you can kind of see that at the bottom of the photo here. It's a grate that catches the water and then directs the water towards a rain garden. And isn't that handy? This one was put in when Norm Cox poured a new driveway. So that's the easiest time to do it. And you can, if you're putting in a new driveway anyway, that's a moment to start planning about where is this water going to go and which way should you tilt the driveway so that the water goes where you want it to go. Which kind of leads us into the, um, an, uh, the second rule, which is water, there has to be space downhill of the water source. Sometimes um, poor Matt Kowalski here wanted to put a rain garden in the back of his uh, yard there behind his driveway and parking space. But the water, the, um, the parking spaces were all tilted, or the driveway was all tilted not in the opposite direction. So you could put a garden back there, but um, it just wouldn't be a rain garden because you're not getting any water to flow into the rain garden. And is there enough sunlight? Uh, people often ask us if, we can, if you can put a rain garden in shade, and yes, you absolutely can. And Harrington's rain garden in shade, you can see here is just beautiful. And actually that rain garden solved a whole, um, four houses were having a flooding problem in their backyard and that rain garden solved it. So it does, it looks very, you know, oh, it's a pretty garden, but it's actually functioning and solving a big neighborhood problem. Okay, so now we're on to where not to put a rain garden, which is a much longer list actually. Um, so we have what we call the Hippocratic Oath of master rain gardeners, which is first, do no harm. We're here to solve problems, not make them. So this, these rules will make sure that you do that. So look at, is there enough space for a rain garden? Are the slopes conducive to where a rain garden should be? Are there any obstacles between your water source and where your rain garden is gonna go? Are there any hazards that you need to avoid? Like, you know, actually life-threatening hazards? And um, where's that emergency overflow? Where is it going? Is it going to somewhere that's not going to cause water in someone's basement or some other problem? Okay, so enough space. When I visited Jonathan's condo here, he really wanted to put a rain garden right between the building and the sidewalk where that blue oval is. And um, that amount of grassy space, it's about five feet wide. That is not enough space for a rain garden. It's too close to that building, and that building um, has a basement. So no, this is not a good place to put a rain garden, even though you can see it didn't have that many options actually. But what you can do when you don't have enough space is take a pipe and move that water around the building so that it comes out at a place where you do have enough water, enough, enough space for a rain garden. This is Sarah Aylin who was putting in a rain garden and she piped her downspout all the way around the side of the building into her front yard where she had enough space and that's where she really wanted to put a rain garden anyway. So she was able to basically, you know, m manipulate where you put this rain garden based on how much space you have. Because the rain garden needs to be, and this is a rule, at least 10 feet from the house. So if that, um, for instance, this is an old neighborhood where the house is about 10 feet from the sidewalk, that's not enough space to put a rain garden. And then look between the sidewalk and the street, there's a big tree. That's not a good place to put a rain garden either. So there's not, not a lot of options here. Actually, when you make up your plan, you can even put a, a line around the house at 10 feet. So you know that like those spaces are all off limits. Which brings us back to my earlier example. Hmm. So look at that space. Is that really, was that rain garden really 10 feet away from the wall of the porch? 
Hmm. What do you think, Shannon? <laughs> It's, I would say that, that is looking a little close to that porch. So, yeah. Uh, hmm, yeah. What's going on here? Oh, yeah. Well, the here's the the trick answer is it has to be ten feet from a basement. So if you're next to let's say a porch or a garage that does not have a basement, you have a little more flexibility. So as master rain gardeners, you know when you can have to follow the rule and when you you can bend the rule right and you still want to be a little bit away you know yeah. you still want to be three to five feet away even if it's from a slab or just from a foundation for a porch you don't want it ponding up against the wood that's a big no-no um, yeah you need that same 10 feet so right oh and also on the other end if you're having water in your basement maybe you want to stay 15 feet away right. so you want to make it even more of a safety margin if you're having water in your basement yep. so the rule can go either way, a little bit closer if there's no basement, but farther away if you're having a problem. Right. Or if you have like a super old, found, like old stone foundation, like you have an old Michigan basement or something like that, you might want to think twice about that too if it looks pretty porous. So that's another right. thing to maybe look at. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so on to obstacles. So what if there's something in the way between where your downspout comes down and where you want to put your rain garden. For instance, here they wanted to put their rain garden kind of in the front. And if you can see that tree there, it's a big old shagbark hickory. And hickories do not like their roots messed with. So um, not only would you disturb this tree's roots by digging the rain garden, but you'd also disturb the roots between the downspout and the rain garden when you dug in your pipe. So though that tree's roots would be severely impacted by this rain garden. So I don't think that's a good idea. But another option is to put the water in that existing bed. There's two small trees and there's a bunch of perennials and that would be a good place to at least put the water and maybe you could just do some rocks and you know make it kind of a, a, a maybe not a rain garden proper but a, slow that water down and let it soak into the perennials and you're doing a lot of good. All right, sidewalks. Often sidewalks are right in the way of where you want to put, where you're trying to get your water from the downspout to the rain garden area. And also, often downspouts are emptied right onto the driveway where they create a big puddle, they're creating water where you're trying to walk every day after you're getting out of your car and up to the front door. In the winter, it's icy. That's not good either. And so there's this big sort of safety hazard here that you'd like to fix by putting maybe your rain garden in that nice grassy area to the to the um, on the opposite side of the walk. Oh, there's plenty of space. Also, uh, there's a beautiful view of beautiful being um, uh, joking that it's not beautiful of the AC unit and the foundation of the neighbor's house. So maybe that would be nice if you could block it a little bit with some plants and wouldn't that be pretty? So you really want to put the water from where it is to the other side of the sidewalk. How to do that? Well, there's a few ways. One is that you can take that slab of concrete up, put the pipe in, re-pour a slab of concrete. That's one option. Another option is to put the pipe underneath, and you need enough space on both sides of the sidewalk in order to dig big holes on either side. And you can, this is a um, technique that was uh, tried out by master rain gardener David Dye, who said, oh, I can put a pipe under a sidewalk. So what you do is you dig a big hole on one side, and you put a PVC pipe there and you pound, pound, pound until it stops and then clean out the inside with a power washer and then pound, pound, pound and then clean out the inside with a power washer. That's what David did actually for Magda here and put the pipe underneath the sidewalk. So it goes from one side to the other and if you hit a, you know, a big rock then you know, you're, you're just stuck. Um, but if it works then it's nice because then you don't have to repave the sidewalk. She was able to get the water from one side to the other. She was putting in a rain garden between her sidewalk and her street. So that easement area, and you can see that it got all filled up with water. She's This is like in the middle of construction, but she's pretty happy with having it all dug because that's the big, the big part. And then it, she planted it on a beastly hot day, as I recall. It was brutally sunny. And I just dropped by here yesterday and took this photo, and this is what it looks like now, just looking gorgeous and beautiful. So there are some rules about putting... Uh, about plants in between the sidewalk and the street in that easement area and that rule is that those plants can be no taller than 18 inches and the reason is because you're going to be um, backing out of your driveway 
and you need to be able to see oncoming traffic. So on a busy street, it's even more important, but even on a residential street, you need to be able to see that oncoming traffic. Yep. So and 18 so I would yeah, I would just interject. That's actually code in some places, and mm -hmm. in some places it's not. So you might want to actually check with your local authorities to see if they have an actual um, code for that. Um, and Ann Arbor is 18 inches, um, and it's just good practice. But if you're working in the right of way like that, which is that section between the sidewalk and the back of the curb, you're going to need to talk to your local folks anyway because there could be a lot of utilities in there and things like that. So at that point, it's a good time just to check to see if they have have any um, ordinances or code around what is possible in that what they commonly call the hill strip actually <laughs> getting things to grow in there so anyway I just thought I'd interject that oh and another you know you also brought up another good point which is when if you're building a rain garden in this area definitely call Miss Dig uh, so we're gonna go over that but it's even more important in this yep. area because it's it's um, there are a lot of utilities in there yeah it's not an option they really are there and so you right. really you, <laughs> you know they're know there where they are <laughs> right exactly right. except the fact that they're there and just deal with it so right yeah right okay um people have had a few questions about putting rain gardens in the easement so I'm glad we were able to touch on that a little bit okay so another way to get under a sidewalk you can see this house uh, in Ann Arbor has a beautiful copper rain chain isn't that pretty so the water comes down the rain chain and then needs to go underneath their front walkway and I have another picture that shows it a little bit better this is a winter shot where the water goes under that walkway so that's concrete on either side and then there's actual pavers that create a bridge where the water goes under that little bridge and then I think the brilliant part about this is that in order to if it gets clogged with leaves or something like that, you could take up those papers and unclog it and then put them right back. So this is another way that you could get water under your sidewalk. <laughs> and this one, <laughs> this is, uh, I'm just laughing because um, Shannon <laughs> thinks this is just kind of a ridiculous um, uh, solution, but you can go over that sidewalk as well. Is you know, the overland <laughs> option. <Yes. laughs> So, and, and I don't have a problem with this so much in terms of like how the water is going to flow, but I just feel like, you know, you could work it a little bit more than the standing two by four there, you know, like if you were going to do a trellis perhaps or something like perhaps. that, but you know, it's the zone, it's, you know, That's his right. garden, you can figure it out. And, uh, but Susan and I have a little running, little running joke around this, around this approach. So. That's right. Well, actually a trellis was their plan. And perhaps they've built it by now, actually. Um, also, Ann Novak in the class has an existing pergola off the front of her house, like a really Perfect. big, substantial one. Yeah. And we figured out that she could just run her downspout, sort of thread it through, and then down the other side. And yeah. you wouldn't even notice the downspout. It would be totally hidden um, by the Yeah, pergola. you can just paint it the same color, you know, mm -hmm. something like that. Um, and just make sure it's flowing downhill. Because mm -hmm. that's the thing, it's like it can hide behind a big beefy trellis piece that's big enough uh, to be able to kind of capture the slope of that gutter. Um, so you don't want to run it flat, even though it looks really pretty with your trellis that way, you want <laughs> still water to flow downhill. So, yeah. Yep. All right. Oh, and then this is an, an artist, and actually, I'm not sure who the artist is here. Uh, perhaps it's Lori Kantner. I'm not exactly. Uh, sure, but so if anyone knows, I'd love to give this artist credit because what a beautiful sculpture. And it functions because it takes the water from the roof into the rain garden. So beautiful and the salmon are swimming uphill. Um, and also, this is so pretty and it really made lemons out of, or lemonade out of lemons because it is hiding a dumpster. Like that's what's back there. So it looks beautiful and, and it um, changed the view from the view of a dumpster to the view of this beautiful garden plus a sculpture. So use your imagination. I want to see beautiful, beautiful um, uh, examples of people, how they're going to get the water from the house to the rain garden. Because it doesn't have to just be a pipe. It can be something out of your imagination. And I'd love to see it. OK, so next, um, the slopes. Are they just too steep to reasonably put a rain garden there? This property, the property line is the fence post. So the rain garden would have to like kind of like get in and it's really steep and it would have to knife in there you'd have to build a retaining wall in order to make a flat spot on this steep slope and um, you wouldn't get that much storage out of it you wouldn't get that much water volume just because of the steepness of the slope also I just want to put down that there 
if you're going to put a, if you need to put a wall in, if it's more than two feet tall, you should really shouldn't put a rain garden behind it. I'm just going to put that out as a general rule. So um, when you start think, looking at slopes, if it's too steep, it, it might just be a lot of work and a lot of walls. But yeah, so keep that in mind. Okay, so calling Miss Dig, there are utilities underground. And if you call Miss Dig, which means you call 811, they will tell you, they will come out and mark those utilities on your ground. So it'll look kind of like this and they'll have all these paint marks. And the colors correspond to different utilities. So gas is yellow, electric is red, and the phone cable is orange. The other two, water and sewer, are so far down that it's, it, you don't have to worry about those as much. But the first three, you, if they're there, you could hit them. And gas, in theory, should be deeper than that. But I've had rain gardens who have found the gas line six inches deep. So be very, very careful with these utilities, especially gas, because you don't want to have to have your block evacuated. That would be bad. So don't do that. Because you never know what's going to be down there. All sorts of things you find down um, underground, which uh, actually Master Rain Gardener Pat Martz is going to come in next week and tell her story about all sorts of interesting things that she found underground when she dug her rain garden. So look forward to that. Okay, also if you are not on city water and you have, or city um, sanitary and you have a septic field, then find out where it is because often it just looks like a big grassy area. It's not necessarily marked on the ground. So if you do have a septic field, look into your, um, look into the paperwork that you got when you bought your house and figure out where it is. And don't put your rain garden on the septic field. It just puts too much water into the septic field and it will overload the system. So. Okay, so with all those rules in mind, here is a couple of folks who, they were deciding where should we put this rain garden. Let's kind of go through their decision-making process so you get some practice. So one option was the right side, and you can see that there's a downspout right there, so isn't that handy? The front walk is, of course, in the way, so they'd need to put the water under or over or, you know, solve that problem in some way. But it would also be right where they walk up to their house every day, so they'd see it every day. That's kind of nice. On the left side, they're on a corner lot, so there's a sidewalk right next to that uh, location as well. There's also a big old ma uh, silver maple there that there might, they might hit some roots, so they'd want to keep that in mind. They could probably capture three downspouts uh, in this location because they could do the two closest ones, and then they could pipe perhaps the, the uh, rear one around to also go to this location. So those are the pluses and minuses of both locations. They decided to put it on the left side, and there it is, all planted and blooming. I see Buckeye Susan and Leatris in there. Um, but either, it's, there's not a wrong answer here. You could put it either place. And they put uh, the one on the left side first, but they could do the other rain garden the next year. I mean, don't do more than one a year just because that's a lot of work. But, uh, do, but they could do the next one the next year, and that'd be fine. Hey, Susan, oh, can I interrupt yeah. for one second, too? Yeah. And that is the, and on that left side, there was also a big tree. So yeah. they needed to be aware of that. And so if you go back to the slide previous, um, yeah. you can see that they, you know, mm, we have to be aware of those tree roots and everything like that. So what they ended up doing is moving it to the left of the left side mm -hmm. and moving it kind of outside of the range of that tree root zone and still capturing a lot more stormwater that way. So that's right. Okay, so on to the percolation test. Shannon, right in that spot where everyone has decided where they're going to put their rain garden, how do they do a percolation test? All righty, time to get out the shovel. Um, and you dig about an 18 inch deep hole and you um, fill it up with water once and let it drain and then you fill it up again and that's where you start your stopwatch. We're not talking minutes here. Sometimes actually we have had some sites where the water actually disappears in 10 minutes which is kind of outrageously amazing so that doesn't happen very often um, but we're talking hours like how many hours you don't need to stand there the whole time and just watch it you can kind of come out and check periodically um, for some people it actually never even perks it just kind of eventually evaporates so that's sort of one way end of this um, of the um, spectrum and then the the 10 minute version is is the other end of the spectrum and what we're really just trying to get a sense of is your basic percolation rate 
which tells us about your soils, which will help guide you in how to um, pick your plantings for your garden. Because if you have super sandy soils that dry really fast, and they're, they dry up really fast, then that's kind of a different set of plants that you would use. Or if you have the the thing that never infiltrated at all and just evaporated, you definitely need to pay attention to what kind of plants you're using in that sort of situation. So um, this will tell you a lot. It'll help inform us a lot too about what particular situation you have. And if you just dig that hole, fill it up once, fill it up twice, and watch it um, you know, periodically and let us know generally how many hours it takes, that's what you need to do. And that'll be your homework this week. Yes. Pay attention. All right, so Katie, do are any other um, questions that come in today? Yeah, Audrey would like to know if you can put a rain garden near a fence. Fence. So fences, um, you can. You don't want it ponding up against the post, uh, so you want to give it a little bit of a border there, um, and uh, it. I think that if you have a fence post in a concrete footing, that's a little easier than just fence posts that are just stuck into the ground with nothing around them. This is wood that I'm talking about. So maybe from a wood fence where there's no concrete footing, you stay like two feet away. But if you've got a concrete footing, then you could probably stay a foot away. But again, you just don't want water ponding up against it. But yeah, you can put it next to a fence, I would say. Susan, any other thoughts? Yeah, I think well, well put. All right. Um, so we should probably be moving on. How big should this rain garden be? So now you have some sense of where you're going to put it. How big do you need to um, make it? And um, first off, I just want to say that if you are allergic to math and you never want to do math again in your whole life, the, the rain gardens end up being about as big as a parking space. So about that big, plus or minus, you'll be fine. And you can always make it small and then make it bigger the next year. So or smaller, you you know, it can change over time. So if you want to just sort of wing it, then it generally this area, this space is what you want to do. But if you want to figure out exactly how big your rain garden should be, it depends on how much water is getting to it. So how we figure that out is we measure the size of the roof area or other hard surface that is draining to this rain garden. So um, just measure that hard surface is the first step, and then the rain garden is going to be 20% of that area. So for instance, that uh, roof, um, bird's eye view of the roof that we just saw is this uh, house. And we're trying to figure out how much, wa how, what, how big should the rain garden be if we're directing the downspout that you can see in, with the pink arrow is going to this rain garden. So how big does this rain garden need to be? Well, first, let's figure out which part of this roof really goes to that downspout so we'll be directed to the rain garden. It's only the pink area not the blue area. The blue area you can see goes to two other downspouts on the other side of the roof and so when you're sizing your rain garden you only need to size it, size it for the amount of hard surface that's draining to the rain garden. So in plan view you can see the pink area is just that area that's outlined in pink there and you can measure that either outside, you know, use a measuring tape outside uh, of your house or you can go on Google Earth has a nice measuring tool and you can find your house and just measure it on there. So the rain garden area is 20% of that drainage area. So length times width of the roof times 20% uh, and you get your rain garden area. So if the roof was 40 by 20 feet, that's 800 square feet of roof times 0 0.2, you get 160 square feet of rain garden. So about 10 by 16, about that general area. But it doesn't have to be rectangular. And actually we're going to teach you in a future class how to measure the size of your rain garden even if it's not rectangular. So stay tuned for that. All right, so what are the elements? What are all the different parts of a rain garden? Now that we've started to think about um, where to put it and how big to put it, make it, how to, what are all the different things that we're going to be building in the future so people can start thinking about that? Okay, so I'm going to go over that piece for you. And the first um, most basic part is really the basin itself. And if you think about it as a bathtub, that's kind of a helpful um, a metaphor to use in your mind. So the bathtub, the basin, is really that big flat bottom area where you want the water to infiltrate into the ground. And it's important that it's flat. Um, so we don't want it pitching one direction or the other because you want to maximize the area that the water will soak into the ground. And if it's pitched, then 
then it's all going to go to the low end. So you want it to be as flat as possible. We will go over methods for that um, in uh, next week's class so that you'll understand how to, how to um, keep yourself from cheating on that one because it's pretty easy <laughs> to cheat on that one because it's hard to dig. Um, so uh, that basin is that bathtub area. So another element of the rain garden is the conveyance, how you're getting the water there. And there's a couple of different ways that you can do that. So one, and you've seen a lot of these so far in some of the examples, are uh, pipes. So you can take a pipe from the downspout and take it there um, and uh, get it to where you want it to go. So pipe is helpful in that way because you can really direct it um, pretty easily, especially if you don't have room in the area where the downspout um, is, is coming out uh, around your house. So that pipe goes over there and you can see um, here there's a couple of different conditions that uh, where you can see this pipe coming out. If you notice on that lower left, it's got a little screen on it, which is a very smart idea because critters want to get up in that pipe. I don't know what it is that's so attractive about that, but they just seem to like to get up there and explore. And um, the last thing you want is like dead chipmunks in there, which has happened um, to us. So uh, make sure you put some sort of screen on the end to keep the critters from getting out. The other piece is that um, you can see where the water is coming out. You often can put a few rocks because that water, if you can see in that upper right picture, comes out pretty fast when the rain is intense and it's just skipping right over that rock <laughs> that they had used uh, to try to break up the velocity of it and it can really erode things. So it's great to have a little um, zone that can help dissipate some of the energy of that water coming out. Then the other thing you'll notice in these photos is that it's all this white PVC pipe. It's a rigid pipe. And um, Susan, if you could go back one, actually, I can just show, uh, you can see a, a rigid pipe allows you to really be able to control the slope of that pipe, the angle of that pipe. And um, so it, it's a little bit more expensive than the, the black uh, bendy stuff, which we'll show you in the next slide. But you can be very precise about that water flowing downhill. And um, especially in a really flat situation, you're really going to want to use one of these white pipes. Now, there's a couple of different grades of them. You don't need the super heavy duty Schedule 40 stuff that's more expensive. You just need the thin walled version. Um, that's fine, unless you're going to be driving over it, putting it under a driveway or something like that, which is unlikely for most of you. So there's also the black bendy stuff. So the downside of the black bendy stuff is that um, it can be lumpy. So somebody put in the black pipe stuff at my house when I was not around and it must just go up and down all over the place under the ground because when the rain comes it takes literally five minutes for that water to actually exit the pipe because it basically has to fill the entire thing up because it's kind of going up and down and up and down underneath the ground. So if you have really good pitch then not so big of a deal because it's just going to go you know straight down but if it's pretty um, flat, then it's probably better to use that, that white PVC pipe. Um, so uh, there's also different connections. So you can just go to the hardware store and be able to buy this connection to attach it to your gutter. And then the other piece is that you can see in that lower left corner, that's a way um, uh, to deal with it at the end. Not everybody just lets it flow out um, and drop down. This is called a pop-up, which you've probably seen before. In a huge rainstorm, that thing will actually, like, lift off and launch. Um, so you kind of have to be able to just make sure that you're um, kind of paying attention. The other piece is that there's a little tiny hole at the bottom of that elbow that allows water to drain down. However, it's a pretty tiny little hole and, um, you know, one leaf covering it up and then it doesn't drain down. So um, you probably want to make that opening bigger. You could kind of cut a slit you know, to uh, across the bottom of that thing, um, but somehow open that up a little bit with some of your own, um, you know, elbow grease and a tool to be able to uh, make that thing drain down more easily because that's kind of a downside is you don't want that thing sitting full of water in the wintertime, freezing up, and then that means that, you know, ice dams are happening on your roof because your whole gutter is frozen. So make sure there's a way for that water to get out. Using a pop-up, means that there's less digging involved. And we will go over that uh, next week for you. Um, but it is a handy tool. Many people um, end up using this method, um, and then other people don't. So you, you can see examples either way. So that's conveyance via pipe. 
Um, the other way is just to go overland with it um, and just skip the pipe altogether and you create a swale or you may already have, it may already be flowing downhill in kind of a defined path. Um, but you can see in this graphic here that there's these kind of gentle mounds and they're directing the water uh, down to the rain garden. Um, now that takes some work too if you don't have, um, you know, uh, there's there's earth moving involved in this. <laughs> you don't just want to nest well you could dig a little ditch and fill it with stone something like that however the stone um, uh, here is like you can see really pretty um, looks great uh, in a year or two there's gonna be a lot of weeds growing up in that stone there's probably enough gardeners out there to that know like stone looks great that first year maybe second year and then it starts filling up with organics and then the weeds start coming so it is a maintenance issue over time I just want you to have your eyes open if you're choosing that um, version of things um, so but the swale means that you don't have to do as much digging either so that's the nice thing about using a swale. Um, it also can disappear more along the way too. So um, because you're kind of infiltrating along the way, uh, depending on your soils. But um, swale is a perfectly acceptable way to have conveyance happen as well. Get that water down to your rain garden. Alrighty. So the other piece is a berm, which is basically where you're putting, you're digging this thing, right? And you might be able to do a little bit of what they call cut and fill where you're sort of digging one side and filling another and we'll show you next week how that all works. But basically you're going to be digging and you need a place to put all that dirt unless you happen to have a super handy, you know, pickup truck and can go dump it someplace or spread it somewhere else in your yard, which you could do too. But the berm is where you can put your spoils. It also helps the water sort of stay in too. Um, you want to be a little careful with it if you have really chunky clay clod stuff you can't the water will escape out of that so you got to make sure that it's more broken up and that the it's got a nice sort of um, like the texture is more fine uh, so if you do have those big clods of clay you got to pulverize it basically and maybe mix it with some things to be able to make it a more of a solid a surface because you don't want water migrating laterally sideways through that berm. So the berm is just kind of holding holding things in and a place to deal with the spoils from where you're digging your rain garden. Some people get really fancy and instead of a berm they do a wall. Um, so this is a lot of work uh, and Kathy Dyer has every reason to be like holding her arm up like that because shoving those rocks around is no small task so just realize you're taking that on um, to, to be able to make that work or you can you know have your striving teenage kid do it for you um, or <laughs> I like pay that idea. director to do it you know you could do that too um, and you can have it on that side that is retaining it, you know, behind the curb or in this example, you can see it's kind of holding up the lawn side of it. So if it's the side, if, Susan, if you could go back one actually with the, the stone wall where it's sort of holding it in on the one side. Um, you don't, I mean, if, you know, those stones aren't exactly, uh, you know, this is, is not Machu Picchu where you have like, you know, you can't even slip a piece of paper in between the stones, right? This is like big cobbly rock that we have here. This is glacier, you know, rounded stuff. And so water will just migrate right to the side of that. So what you need to do is backfill about a foot with real soil behind that in order to make that work. Um, because you don't want water just, again, spreading laterally through it. So that's your berm. It's the same concept as, as the other. So um, you can also do a wall out of what's called unit block. This is made out of concrete block that it's kind of, you know, colored and textured and things like that but it's kind of Lego like in terms of putting it together which is really handy and nice still the same concept you've got to have that um, that zone behind it and you can see the process here of uh, building that so um, you know again these are this is not for the faint of heart to be able to take this thing on you can see you have to do a big trench you have to put some gravelly stuff underneath it and behind it a little bit too and um, then you're laying that stone on top and you can see how he just kind of went through this whole um, process Steve Cronenberg um, did this one and Susan you want to show the final one again? I just took this photo today actually awesome great Isn't that pretty yeah really nice so again his wall is not over two feet either 
So I think that that's a, a really good general rule that Susan talked about. If you are going to take on the wall, you start needing to kind of engineer it more if it's um, above two feet. So keep it simple. Um, be easy on your body. <laughs> Try to do it less than two feet. But it is possible because it does save a lot of space uh, to be able to have it uh, with a wall. So we're going to talk about the outlet. So this is something that, um, you know, I use this bathtub analogy. But what you don't want is equal opportunity water just spilling over the top if your rain garden fills up because your rain garden will fill up. There will be times, especially in the very beginning before your plants are really established. And Harry talked about that curve, you know, where we're getting like that, that th those most frequent storms, but there will be just big old gully washes that come around and fill up your rain garden. And there needs to be a place where the water escapes in a controlled way. And it really is like your bathtub. If you see that out outlet there. That's that kind of mystery thing that, you know, you fill up the bathtub, the phone rings, you go answer the phone, and that thing's going to save you, right? Because the water's going to flow out of there if um, so it doesn't go all over the top. So we need to be able to figure out the equivalent of that in a site situation. There is no reason you need to put a stone wall all around your entire rain garden, but this photo shows the outlet really clearly, so that's why I like this one. So you can see you have this kind of level um, edge all the way around. You can actually see that inlet too in that back left corner, and then the outlet is on this other side and when it all fills up then it spills out and you can control that. It gives you control actually over your garden which is really nice because you can raise the outlet or you can lower the outlet depending on how much water is in there. Um, in this case they actually did it with a pipe. This is more kind of like that bathtub photo in a way. Um, that's what that's uh, that's how that's acting. And they didn't want to mess with some of the tree roots that were in this area, so that was a really good option for them. Um, but it doesn't have to be in a pipe. But you, it often is in a place where oh, and here's Rogers. Um, he's going to be talking today. He had an old piece of tile from a bathroom renovation that he ended up adapting for this. So I love how people just come up with their own uh, solutions for this. But it is nice to have a spot where you can kind of armor it in some way, shape, or form because water will be spilling out of there. So you can kind of line it with stone or line it with bathroom tile like, like uh, Roger did. Um, but you need a place for that water to go and you need to think about where that is because you do not want that outlet going back towards your house, right? It's really, really important. And this is where if you have a super flat site, it can get very tricky because you don't want that water going backwards heading towards that window well. That would be bad, bad, bad news. So you want a little bit of pitch. And you can see here, try to make that outlet be a good six inches vertically in elevation lower than where that top of that window well um, is because you just don't want to mess with that at all in terms of possibility of water getting back there because here's what it looks like. It ain't pretty, folks. So um, I think that it's really important that we kind of think of these larger issues as we're doing the planning uh, for this stuff. And this is where, you know, this is not the information you get on your big web search for rain gardens, right? This is like the stuff we've learned over time. <laughs> so that you're really thinking through this big picture stuff and making sure you're making good choices about where you're going to be placing yours. Yeah, um, that's yeah, that's a good point. Like these are all the things that you want to. Um, this is what mean. This is what makes people comfortable to decide to put a rain garden in their property at their property because they've gone through all these steps and made sure that they're gonna solve problems and not create them. Okay, so actually, uh, Roger Moon is here with us, and he's going to talk about building his rain garden, which included an uh, an emergency overflow, just like we were talking about. Actually, Roger hosted a field trip last year for our class, so there's the class hanging out at his most recently built rain garden. Welcome, Roger. All right. Wait, okay. I think he's... Oh, hi, Roger. How are you? Okay, are you getting the voice? Yeah, now I can hear you. Okay. All right, here's the uh, the start of the rain garden. You can see over my shoulder there is a porch. And uh, at the beginning, to learn the drainage area, I measured it out at 165 square feet. Uh, as a result of the percolation te test, uh, which uh, took about 24 hours to uh, to drain, I decided to go a little higher on the on the ring garden size here, so 
you're doing the math, multiplying the 165 square feet times 28%, and they get about a 46 uh, square foot garden, nice and small. And it it's, works out nicely because it's circular, and that's about an eight foot diameter. So it's uh, so I then marked it out on the ground. You can see I've got some old tiles that I uh, I just took the eight foot two by four and just rotated it and put the tiles in their place. That's how it was done. Uh, next, uh, I decided to remove the existing ground cover, which was sod in this case. Uh, there is a, uh, you can't see from this picture, but there is a slight downward slope of about 5% uh, from the upper part of the garden to the lower part. Uh, and I just cut the grass uh, with a spade uh, into small little squares. It makes it easier that way. It's kind of like, just like cutting a cake. And you scoop it up and I put it off to the side on the uh, on the right there because I'm going to use some of that in the next step. Okay, uh, leveling the bed. Uh, as uh, Shannon pointed out, uh, you want the bed to be somewhat very close to level so it doesn't puddle on one end or the other. You want to expose as much ground area as possible to the water coming in. In this case, uh, since it's on a slope, the uh, left side has to be lowered. As, as I recall, I think this was about five inches. Uh, so you just, um, a spade is again an easy way to do this and you just start at one end and uh, start removing that dirt. I like your um, uh, two by four level. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's a good way to do it. That's, that's and uh, that tells you uh, how much dirt you have to remove on the high end. Right. Also, it's about five inches, yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't have any helpers for this. Yeah. <laughs> so I do Good like that. Right? <laughs> <laughs> there we go. They're too hard to control. <laughs> so anyway, uh, so I did all the levering, leveling, so you're saying, well, what did I do with that dirt? Well, there's a berm. Uh, there wasn't really enough dirt to um, make that berm, so I started out by using sod upside down underneath around the perimeter. So this photo a, really, this photo really shows that the soil is clay. Yeah, it is yeah. blue. It is blue clay, and it, you can see it's even shiny. Yeah. Uh, I would suggest if someone is encountering this that they do it in the spring as early as possible when the clay is wet. Uh, Shannon was pointing out that if you wait until it's a little drier and starts getting clumpy, very difficult to make a berm at that point. Mm. Uh, in this case, I was able to uh, dig up the, the clay, clay and, and just tamp it down and it, it sealed it off well. Uh, the next step is to, uh, since it's all clay, you have to mix in some organic material, in this case is compost, and I used a mantis tiller. A mantis tiller will not cut through wet clay. It'll just bounce along the top. So you, would, if uh, I did have to take a shovel, break the clay up first, then break the clay up with the tiller, then add the compost and proceed that way. You can yeah. also see I, I have, you can see in this photo, the uh, drain underground drain pipe, which is a flexible drain pipe. It's a short distance there. And the garden is a little over 10 feet from the basement wall, by the way. And I had previously, and I had previously uh, called Miss Dig to make sure, because there's a gas pipe not far from this. So uh, there we are. And now, uh, finally, the plants go in. And uh, I had some uh, ceramic tile. So I made a, uh, a spillover or overflow and that uh, has two purposes. It controls the depth of the water that it comes in there and it also uh, drains the water off to the neighbor's driveway where it can safely go to the street. 
Yeah. You know, someone else was asking me about that. Like, what, what do you mean by a safe place? And you can, I mean, the water then can go to the lawn or to the driveway, you know, into the street. At that point, you've done your good deed by having the water go through a rain garden. So yeah. as long as it doesn't go through to, towards your house, you're good. Right. Okay, and here we are uh, this past June, a year later. And yeah. uh, you see, I've added some tile edging around the around the perimeter. And that's just uh, to uh, help on the war of fighting the grass that wants to climb in there. <laughs> right. So it's just just uh, maintenance reducing, uh, reducing item. Right. Uh, the cost to build this, ay, 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 $50. Um, <laughs> I, uh, the excavation was DIY, compost was City of Ann Arbor, and I used a little over a third of the yard. And... Um, the plants were transplanted from another garden, and the mulch uh, was. I had that put mulch in other areas, and I just, I just estimated I used about uh, six yard, uh, about a half a yard uh, worth of mulch, about nineteen dollars. You know, also um, you can always transplant from your own yard, but we will also have two plant swaps this fall. So there'll be more opportunities to get right. plants from people with full gardens who are happy to give them to you. Thank you so much, Roger, for giving us, you know, the tour of your, uh, this was your fourth rain garden that you've built yourself on your property. No, it's many more because you've helped other people uh, build their rain gardens too, yeah, right? I, Given I, them I, advice. It was probably the third or fourth. I don't know. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you so much. And thank you for all yeah. your hard work. Um, volunteering for our other rain garden projects, research and things like that. We really appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Roger. Okay. Bye -bye. So we, are there any questions that have come up, Katie, that we should answer right here in class? Yeah. Neil wants to know, what if the hard surface flowing into your garden is from a parking lot or a road? It's not just from your roof. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I just want to point out the limits of this class, and that is that we're really talking about residential rain gardens from a driveway or a roof. When you start getting into larger projects like parking lots and all the water that's coming down the ditch for a mile and a half from your street, like those sorts of projects are in an entirely different scale and they take different tools. Yeah. Um, yeah, and and uh, we can we can support you know it somewhat, but we need to have a lot of information about the context to be able to make those decisions. Because right. if the water is coming down your road, like Susan is saying, and you're building up an entire watershed behind it, then you know you, you, I, there it may be something that's pretty straightforward actually that we could help you with, could or be. it could be like way more complicated. Um, right. And so, so check with us before you do. Check that. with us first. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, yep. first because time. we can probably give you a sense of you know whether it's something that is doable or not um, because in some ways you're just making it better right yeah but we also want you to know what you're getting yourself into and salt is a big issue you know with those with those things. sediment so, yeah. so get a lot more salt sediment. and sediment. a lot more velocity big, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yes all right thank yeah. you thank you sure. so much Katie. Um, so keep that in mind. All right, so shade plants. What are some plants that rain gardeners can put in their shady rain garden, Shannon? Okay, um, ferns are wonderful. Um, this is called sensitive fern, and Anacleus and Sibilis, and sensitive because it's sensitive to frost, not because it's any kind of sensitive creature that can't take, you know, rain garden situations at all. It is the one of the more sunny ferns that I know. I wouldn't say it's full blasting sun, but it definitely can take some parts on, which is really um, fun to be able to have that. It's pretty short. 18 inches ish, foot to 18 inches, which is also kind of unusual for a fern. So it has an unusual texture as well for a fern um, and a kind of a light uh, green color. And it can take that, that wet bottom, those moist sides. Um, that said, we tried it in a really wet way in Rain Garden, like super, super, super wet. And it was not as happy there. So um, I think that we need to, you know, just point out that every once in a while, it goes outside of what our normal is, but generally speaking, wet bottom, moist sides, great plant to use. We'll take the shade and, and a little bit of sun as well. Sense I love that it's like a kind of a limey light color too. Yeah, it is. It's yeah. really cool. 
So this is great blue lobelia or lobelia syphilitica. It was once believed that you could treat syphilis with it. I would not try that at home now. I think we have better methods now. Um, this is also a shade plant, part sun, and will take full sun if it's moist enough. So uh, for those of you that are dealing with sun that have, you know, soils that hold more water or that you know you're getting a lot of water in your rain garden, um, this is a plant that could happen in the sun too. Um, so, uh, but the thing that I love about this plant, one of the things I love about this plant, I would say, I, I should say, is that it comes at the end of the summer. So it comes in August and it's this clear bluish purple color that just is such a nice cool antidote to all of the kind of sunflowery, yellowy, orangey stuff that's out there in the world at that time of year and it just feels kind of serene and cool. So it's a really wonderful plant. Um, here we combined it with, um, uh, this is at the Burns Park Rain Gardens in Ann Arbor. We combined it with this uh, plant called Hot Lips Turtle Head. I don't know who comes up with these names, but <laughs> Hot Lips it is. Um, and it blooms at the same time, and they're really gorgeous together. So that was super fun to be able to find that combo. And then you can see Fox Edge in between, which is a much lighter um, leaf. So that looks kind of nice with those as well. So. The next one is wild ginger. This is one of our woodland plants. It really doesn't have, it's a foliage plant. It's not much of a flower. It does have a flower, but it's not anything that you're ever going to really notice. Um, this is a short uh, woodland plant that forms big mats and texture areas. Um, it is not like deep underwater kind of plant, but it that, that kind of um, not right where the inlet is coming in, I would say, but it can definitely be on the on the moist bottom to a certain extent and the sides. Um, it's a great, neat foliage plant. It really likes the shade. It does not like the sun at all. So this is really in this shade category. And I have seen it before where it like comes up to the edge of something and then it will just stop because that's where the sun is. So really right. it is a shade, shade plant. The other downside, and I have this in my rain garden, and which is sandy, so I'm on the drier side, is that this guy is not a super deep-rooted thing. It is a woodland plant that is used to kind of moist-ish conditions with a lot of leaf litter and things like that. So when it gets droughty, it just lays flat. It, yeah, does, that's not, true. it does not um, die. It'll just be kind of miserable looking for a while and but I find myself that I tend to support it with some water when it's really droughty just because I don't want it looking so pathetic because it really <laughs> it just lays down and says please please water me so um, you know not all native plants are super deep rooted I think this is just used to those moist woods conditions but for those of you that are kind of dealing with the neat neighbor thing or you really want it to be super neat looking the wild ginger is a great option mm -hmm. for um, for that condition so it's a it's a really cool plant plant. This one, um, early meadow rue or Thelectrum diocum, can take dry shade in a big way. It's amazing. So um, this one is growing at the bottom of my rain garden. It's growing on the dry berm and it's in total shade and it's happy as a clam. Also, not a flower plant. It flowers. It's wind pollinated. Wind pollinated things don't need to look, look sexy to, to insects at all. So they're just pretty dull in terms of their flowers, but its foliage is wonderful. And any slight little breeze, the whole thing just ripples. It's really beautiful. So um, it's not, again, a place where the inlet is coming in necessarily in terms of that level of water, but it's great for the sides. You can put it on top of your berm, and you can just use it in other places in your garden if, you're, if you have a shady garden in dry areas. I really like this plant. I'd say it's probably um, 18 inches to 2 feet tall, something like that, depending on the soils. So early meadow root. Another interesting one is this is a cultivar um, of Aurelia cordata sun king. It looks like a shrub, so I'm kind of, we usually try to talk about one shrub a day um, uh, per class. And so this one really behaves like a shrub, but actually in the wintertime it does just go all the way down to the ground. But holy cow, this sun king has this amazing leaf color. So if you have a kind of a dark area that's a little mopey looking and needs a little sparkle, this is an amazing plant. The deer do not eat it. 
at all. Even in our most high pressure deer situation, the um, Aurelia does not get eaten. And I've seen it in moist and I've seen it in dry, even in drier shade. So it's a great, it's a great plant to try. It gets to be probably anywhere from three to five feet when it's a little older and happy. Um, but it's a really interesting, um, really interesting plant to try. I have the straight native Aurelia racemosa in my yard and I love that plant too. They're yeah, both. that's a neat one. So except for last class where we were just trying to do those super slam dunk plants, we want to put out the possibility of people trying something that we've never tried but we have great suspicions that it actually may work. So this is a plant called Monk's Hood and um, I mean, look at that color, holy cow. And that is coming up in the fall. So this is like September, stuff like that. And um, we think this one would be a really interesting one to try. It's pretty tall. The foliage, I'd say, is in the two foot range. And then you have this amazing kind of um, candlestick you know, effect going up that is uh, just that deep, deep, deep color is incredible. So it would be really fun if somebody tried it and let us know because that is the only way that we learn these things is by people <laughs> trying them and then communicating with us about it. So um, let us know on Facebook or whatever or give us a call or an email. And, try it uh, in your rain garden. Yeah. Try it in your rain garden, absolutely. So we just think that this one would be interesting and we think it could be successful based on what we know about the kind of plant's heritage. It's not a native. Um, but That's right, it's not a native. Although most of the plants we do talk about are native. Yes. Yep, definitely. Okay, so in wrap up, let me talk about um, the homework that you will be assigned this week, and this will um, go. This will basically get you one step closer to having designed your rain garden. You'll be doing all the calculating about where and how big. So first, reevaluate where your rain garden will be located, and maybe you've had some new thoughts now that you've heard all the rules. And then, if your mind has changed, then post those new photos in uh, where you posted the photos before in one of the forums. Then do a soil, percolate, soil percolation test and post the results in hours. Measure the size of your roof or driveway that's going to your rain garden and then calculate how big your rain garden should be by multiplying it by 20%. The quiz will only cover the Hippocratic Oath of Master Rain Gardeners and Plants of the Week. And if you have your data from the first four questions, then put them in there just so it makes it puts it into a nice spreadsheet so that when I um, talk to you later about your rain garden, I'll have that information in an easy, accessible form. But if you don't have it, that's okay. Uh, the plants of the week that we just went over, we'll ask you what those are. All the plants for shade. Thank you so much, everyone. I think we've hit our hour at this point. Um, I'll send you an email with reminders about the homework and a link to the quiz. Good luck and have fun with all of your outdoor homework this week because there's a lot of outdoor measuring. This is the end of our presentation for class number two. Remember, there are three more. If you're at work, time to go back to work. I'm sorry. Uh, but we'll stick around and answer questions. Katie has said that we, they actually, we have some questions here at the ready. But if you need to go back to work, this is a good time. All right. So um, Katie, what are some questions that have come up? Okay, the first one is you talked about how the rain garden needs to be far from trees and someone asked just how far does it need to be? Is it okay if it's just outside of the drip line of that tree? Yeah, so I think a, a large portion of the roots in, in a tree are what, what they call under the drip line. That's kind of a jargony term. So imagine um, that you have the canopy of your tree Think of it as a big circle because generally they're kind of growing in that pattern. Think of those outer branches and then draw a line down from those. And most of the roots are between that edge and the trunk. And um, there are, so it's pretty safe to stay outside of those. It's not to say that you won't run into roots because you may, even if it's outside of the drip line, but it won't necessarily be the big monsters that you have to deal with. I would also say that some trees are actually pretty easy going about digging around too. And so um, the shagbark hickory that Susan talked about, no way, no how. But there are other trees that actually it may not be so terrible to do that there. So if you're like, oh man, the only place I can really do it or I'm going to be you know, under this tree, tell us, uh, show us a photo of what it is and we can tell you if that's the kind of tree that is, you know, not as picky. Um, so because mm -hmm. you might be able to do a little, if, if you don't have a lot of options and we might be able to um, help you kind of think th through that in a more nuanced way. So yeah, that's what I would say. Oh, you know, and something else is uh, I've told several people that if you have kind of a gradual slope and you have a bunch of trees there and that's where you'd like to put your rain garden is it's possible if you have 
species of trees that won't mind this, to just put in berms. Don't dig down. Just put in a series of berms, like kind of corduroy, and then catch the water as it as goes go down. down. Yep. Yeah, and you're not, you maybe you scratch a little bit on the ground, but you basically don't okay. dig. And that's another option. So it's right. always you know, yep. tricks yep. of the trade. <laughs> right. And in terms of the corduroy thing, you're going to want to um, just make sure that each of those little um, zones where you're capturing the water are as flat as you can make them. Yeah. Um, because, you do, again, you don't want it all rushing to one end. So when you're kind of adding these little berms, then you can sort of make it more level in that little zone, I would say, too. OK. Okay, the next question is for the percolation test. Should you wait until a few days after a storm or just not worry about when a storm has come through? Mm. If you if if it's just been raining, then you don't need to do that first dump of water into it. If everything's really saturated, then you just need to do that kind of timed um, version of the water. If it was a few days ago, then you should probably do it. But if it was the night before, then you're probably good. But you'll also see with the digging, if it was a light rain, you're only going to see like the first couple of inches that get wet. And so you need to really, if it, if it rained the night before and it was a good deep rain, you'll just notice that like that 18 inches will be pretty wet. The soil will be moist all the way down through that soil column that you just dug out. If it's only wet in the top portion, then fill it up twice. That's what I would say. Okay. Yeah, so if it rained deeply recently, it actually saves you some right. saves you some time. But it is nice to, um, you know, if you're timing it, to not time it with a day that's going to be raining because then you're adding water to your thing. It's harder to know how accurate it's going to be. So mm -hmm. pay attention to the weather forecast uh, to a certain extent. Okay. Um, the next question is, if you're building a rain garden in the area between your sidewalk and the road, do you need to have some sort of step out zone for people that are parking on the street right next to your rain garden? And if so, how big does that need to be? Mm. Oh, yes. You do have to have a step out zone. Well, I mean, you don't, you're not <laughs> like old lady legally like required. <laughs> yeah, you're not legally required to, you know. No, no, um, yeah, it yeah. Is I mean, that's a good idea. Yeah. yeah, it is the kind thing to do. Or the other thing that some people do is just leave a strip of lawn there uh, to be able to allow you to do that. <laughs> um, so, it, I mean, but, you know, it's not the end of the world to, it's just imagine opening a car door, like where you typically plant, where you're opening a car door, and is, are you going to be just like knocking down half the rain garden by opening the <laughs> door, you know, maybe right. get it or if you know that there's a section, like there's a section along for me where there's no parking and then there's a section for parking and so maybe in the portion where there is parking, you're, you know, you kind of make some accommodations after that, so. And could you just plant a low growing plant like strawberry that can be stepped yeah. on? Yeah, I think you could do yeah. that. Yep, that's a good idea. Um, and you don't want to like, you know, play soccer on it. It's not going to withstand that, but uh, a little bit of stepping every once in a while would probably be fine. Okay, the next question is um, for the berm, instead of just using dirt, could you use some sort of ceramic or metal structure? Oh, ceramic. I'd like to see the ah. kiln for that. Ooh, like, be like a real bathtub. Oh, a kiln, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Um, so it's it's about the bathtub. yeah you. Get it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's Just really cut about out the, the bottom of, of the bathtub. Right, right, there you go. It. Right, right, exactly. Yeah. No, you can do that. Yeah, if you that would work. Strong enough to be able to do that. Um, it's it's really about it. So Susan's getting at it. It's about the joints. Yeah. You know because it, it's going to go into your joints because uh, you're never going to be that tight unless you're like you know a skilled welder or you know something like that <laughs> um, but generally speaking you know uh, like water next to metal rust blah 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 you know so you got to be careful about that um, and uh, so this person it, might have something in mind they might have yeah. a sign you should take yeah. a picture of whatever you're thinking about using yeah. and then we yeah. can weigh in on that because the other piece is like free thaw and durability and all those kinds of things and if it's a bunch mm -hmm. of bathroom tile that's actually holding your water back I would say no 
Um, Roger yeah. had his uh, out at the outside of his room with a bunch of dirt behind it, which is a very different situation than just ponding next to ceramic something. Um, so I would say take a photo of what you're thinking about or describe it, and then um, let us take a look and weigh in. It may be like a no-brainer. Hey, that worked easily, or it could be like, uh, think twice. So I love all these creative ideas. Yeah, right? it's cool. Yeah. <laughs> we like seeing new things. It's yeah. <laughs> Um, all right, I just have a couple of plant questions, and then maybe we'll wrap it up. Um, so first is monk's hood, um, is it poisonous? Yes. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it is. It is. It definitely is. It's one of the more poisonous things out there, actually. So dogs and small children, probably not a great idea um, if you've got those. So yes, monk's hood is definitely poisonous. Okay. Now, um, on the other side of things, does... Sensitive fern pull out arsenic from the soil? Wow, I have no idea. We could look that one up for you, though. Oh, um, so that's this really interesting. Um, uh, so here's a really good new word for you. It's called phytoremediation, and that's the process of plants um, uh, actually drawing um, up uh, issue problem children from the soil like lead or you know thing, or arsenic or things like that um, that they bind that stuff and sometimes if it's not like an actual element on the periodic table um, which is you can't convert those right it doesn't get any lower than that but things like petroleum products and stuff like that there are certain plants that are actually good at like breaking it all down and into its component parts so it becomes much more neutral so this phytoremediation field is pretty new but it's doing a lot of super exciting um, research into that and so um, I don't know specifically about arsenic and sensitive fern but I just got a big new book on phytoremediation so maybe I can mm -hmm. for you and see if there's any uh, data on that one uh, mm. so I don't know phytoremediation I, I, is spelled p-h-y yeah so you're, yeah, so if you're it. searching it yeah. right yeah. yeah so yeah I'm not sure about the arsenic Get back to us with your yes. new volume. Right. <laughs> That's awesome. I can't believe you're light reading. <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, well, you know. I will look it up, though. Um, all right, just one more question. Um, are you legally able to plant around a fire hydrant? Yes. However, in Ann Arbor, it needs to be, it can't be any higher than six inches in height. So that's like native strawberry land or... Um, or um, Susan, help me out here. What's the Canada other one? Canada anemone, probably. Canada anemone, and then the or other sink yellow Sinkafoil. 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 Yeah, right, right, that one. Um, so, and in Ann Arbor, it's a five-foot radius, I think, around it. You know, you just don't want to block your fire. You don't want to hide fire it. hydrant, right? I mean, you don't yeah. want to hide that sucker. Um, and then the other thing to just, uh, we did one um, near a fire hydrant. And we, you know, the water is usually pretty deep, you know, deep, deeply buried in the in the soil. It needs in the city of Ann Arbor, the water pipe five is, feet. The yeah. water pipe is needs five feet over it. And in the area where we were, it was close to five feet, and we were going to be digging down like two feet for this rain garden. So we actually had to adjust our design because we would not have frost depth, which is three and a half feet you know, over that pipe and we could expose it to freezing. So um, you can find some of that stuff out from your city if you're thinking about digging um, around a fire hydrant. Generally speaking, water is pretty deep, but sometimes it can be shallower and you don't want to change the grade too much around them. But um, you can plant around them. You just got to be smart about it. So just, you know, you don't want your house to burn down either, right? So Right. So <laughs> keep your plants short around the yes. uh, yeah. fire hydrant. Wow. We had some good questions this time. Yeah. Nice, nicely done, people. You're really paying attention. Okay, um, so I think that's all the questions we're going to take right now, and I'm really enjoying seeing everyone's design or it's everyone's site selection at this point on Facebook and on Howe's Garden Web, Great Lakes Gardening Forum, and um, it's I can't wait to see people start talk, posting about their percolation tests, and then we'll get into the interesting stuff when we really start designing the rain garden. So looking forward to it. Thank you, everyone, and have a good afternoon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.